Welcome back everyone to World 2018 where I am here with Kuro from the Afrika Freaks after snatching first seed in the group which is absolutely huge and it was a very close game. At one point Kuro, you guys were pushed all the way into your base. How did you manage to come back in that so important game? 사실 이번 경기에 기지까지 정말 밀리면서 불리한 경기였는데 어떻게 역전을 하실 수 있었나요? 아, 이게 이제 그렇게 불리하진 않다고 생각을 했어요, 저희들끼리. 반반인 상태라고 생각을 했고 저희가 이제 한타로 풀어야 되는 상황이라서 저희만 그냥 잘하면은 이길 수 있다고 생각을 해서 믿고 이렇게 잘했던 것 같습니다. But we actually didn't think that we were really that behind. I thought it was 50-50 and I think we had to solve the problem with team fight and we were able to pull that off really well by trusting each other. Wonderful, and that is what uh, worked out. Now, of course, it was a bit of a tough road, a bad start for Afrika, but now you guys look so much better. What do you think some of the biggest obstacles are that you guys overcame with the team to get to the quarterfinals? So I think during the round one, we were not trusting each other enough and our harmony was really bad. So after the first round, we actually had a lot of time having communication with each other to solve the problem. I think it worked out really well and it turned out to be a great result. Yes, absolutely. You bring it home for the LCK with the first seed. But I do want to ask you, you just beat G2, but they got to play again against Flash Wolves. Who do you think is going to come out of the group with you? 그럼 다음 경기 이제 Flash Wolves G2 전에 남았는데 누가 승리해서 같이 8강에 진출할 것 같으신가요? 어 솔직히 경기력으로만 보면은 G2가 올라올 것 같고 누가 올라오든 저희랑은 이제 이제 상관 없기 때문에 <웃음> 아무나 이겨라. <웃음> So in terms of performance, I think G2 will make it out, but it's actually not really a big connection with with Africa anymore. So yeah. I don't really care okay. a lot. Either one is fine. I want to count that as a small yes uh, for G2. Just kidding. Uh, thank you very much. Congratulations, Kuro and Africa. First seed. And now, who is the second one to come out of this group? We're going to find out right now. Back over to you guys. Thank you very much, John. He ain't too worried about it now that they got We're done. Yeah. We're done. Yeah. Goodbye. <laughs> I love it though. Afrika Freaks, after a very poor start to this tournament, 0 2. They do get that one win at the end of day one. All the way here, 3 0 on the day to reverse it entirely and yeah. secure that number one seed. I think LCK supporters can exhale a little bit now after watching Gen G have more losses in their group than Korea had as a region in group stage last year. To be able to bounce back from an 0-2 to 4-0, really recommitting to the play style they had during the regular season, which was fairly slow, which was 4-1, and they did that four times in a row to success. Yeah, and I think the Korean region, like you say, can breathe a little bit because it was a confluence of the not knowing what they wanted to play in the first round robin and Gen G legitimately actually not being good, making the region look worse than it was. But <laughs> actually, Afrika, as it showed in this 3 0, clearly the best team in Group A. All right. That said, we turn our attention to the final game of the day where G2 and Flash Wolves compete for the number two seed and their tournament lives. First thing I want to do is compare the last two team compositions that both of these teams have run on the day. And I think it's interesting to see the adaptations that both teams are making. G2 are still playing a split pusher fighter in the top lane. But but it's a little more team fight focused as we have seen teams struggle to close out games today. And it feels like they are starting to move back closer to a good team fight comp. Yeah, and I think they maybe feel a bit forced to do it just because more and more teams are kind of figuring out, okay, you're gonna draft the two, two strong solo laners to split push. The Cassiopeia here ended up actually being good in the laning phase, pretty decent in team fights, but really hard to play late game. And that was kind of the issue with the G2 draft. And that's kind of my, my concern with how games are going today. They go really long, and the longer into the game you go, the harder it is to play pure split push because you eventually get to the point where they're forcing team fights around Baron or yeah. Elder Drake, and you have to take them. Yeah, and I think the development for Flash Wolves is the fact that they're putting Maple back onto carries as opposed mm. to the start of the group where they're content with him just playing Scion mid. However, the craziness got a little out of control in their last game against Fungbu Buffalo. And I am wondering if they can recover. I've seen a lot of situations like this in Worlds Past where a team has that clincher game against a team they should beat, right? Fungbu right. Buffalo was already eliminated from the tournament when Flash Wolves lost to them. So even though G2's loss was more recent and they have less time to recover, I feel like the fatigue 
and the pressure is actually more on flash wolves here because they had it in the bag if they would have just beaten Fungu Buffalo. That's actually where I think G are gonna be more tired and not tilted, but a little bit more down and angry coming into this game. I know these players very well and, and a guy like Jankos is extremely emotional. This last game on Camille he plays, nothing works for him. You know, he doesn't land the hook shots, he doesn't, doesn't get good ulties, he barely deals any damage. He's the kind of player where mental resets can be difficult. And now we obviously can't do too much of the uh, mindset mm -hmm. thing. We're not in, in the heads of the players, but right. I can see this G2 lineup. Look at today and say, man, we didn't play that great. The PvP game was a complete mess, right? And they had to fight their way back through perks. They lose to Afrika here. Flash was game as well, they lose in the late game. Like, it's been a lot of mistakes. And while we can't know what's going through their heads, what we do know is that mental fortitude is paramount in a situation like this. So regardless of how they're feeling based on those two yeah. losses that both of these teams suffered, the important thing is to reset that mentality coming into this one and make sure that you perform on perhaps your final time on the world stage. And that's where I have a lot of confidence in G2 is the fact that they have players who have played big moments before, and this is potentially the last game of your entire year that you're you're playing. Mm -hmm. I think that they'll be able to turn things around. They'll be able to get themselves pumped back up for this game, even though it is coming after a pretty sad loss. I, I completely believe in these guys' uh, veteran status coming through. All right. Well, based on what you just said, I have a feeling I know where you're going with yeah, your prediction. But I want to get those out onto the board anyway. So, Mark, what are you thinking? Like I said, a little bit obviously, G2 uh, is who I'm going to go with, mostly just based off how Flash Wolves looked in their previous loss to uh, the Fungu Buffalo, whereas I think that last game that we just saw was actually the best game all of Group A, like the entire thing, I think. It was the closest, hardest fought, well fought game. And G2 ended up losing it, but they still looked great. Deficio? Yeah. Uh, I'm going flat yeah. rules, <laughs> yeah. it hurts to say. Um, so, a few reasons. One, I, I like the fact that Flash Rules had an entire game to discuss what are we doing against G2, mm. uh, or a free cave they had actually ended up been facing them. But uh, the fact that they could sit in and discuss, OK, we, we are playing G2 when they lose this game. Uh, we have a, effectively an hour to, to figure out what is, what is the plan. Everyone is fully reset, I believe. They also have veterans on their side who's been here before, played these big games. Also, the fact they get side selection, they grab blue side, it's been a superior side today, at least for flash rules. And it's hard for G2 to find enough bands because they want to get rid of Urgot, they want to get rid of Alistar, but now this Akali pick is also kind of showing up that they need to consider. I see what you're trying to do right no. now. I, I'm predicting G2, you heard the stuff that we, we said before. I think even though they had that close loss to Flash Wolves today, they can get ahead by playing back to their strengths, which is what we've been talking about this whole tournament, Wonder in top lane. I see what you're doing, Deficio. You're thinking, I I'm either going to get my prediction like, right, yes. or G2 is going to get out of the We're group. going late game Taking here. Taking a page out We're of Jack book. I've, I've, seen, I've seen this trick many a time, Deficio. You vote against your own region, hoping that <laughs> it goes the other way. With that, we're you're throwing it back to the Catholics for nervous. the final game of the day, and the one that decides who goes to the knockout stage. Thank you, Dash. And for a matchup this epic, we've brought in Andrew Vidigas Day for this final decider match. And while Deficio may be a traitor to Europe, the one positive thing I can say about Europe is that in tiebreakers, they are 4-0 of all time when it comes to all international events. Europe, they love their ties. Backs against the wall, you need the stats to prop you up. Anything to get you into some positivity. And the same is true for G2. Like the analyst desk was saying, it was by no means a one-sided match. They controlled the pace of a lot of the previous matchup against Afrika. But you got to pick yourselves up thick and fast. And Flash Wolves have actually chosen the blue side for this game, a reward, I believe, for their shorter game time. And thus, let's wait and see what actually falls to first pick, because that's, of course, going to be the big reward. Recently for Flash Wolves, the Akali has been very contested. You would imagine that Alistair is very high on the priority when it comes to either picking or banning away. We know that both Sorda and Wadid would happily grab that champion if it is available. And I believe that it is Sword Art's by far best champion. It really fits into the playstyle that Flash Wolves love to utilize. But the question is, do you ban one and then not be surprised if there's a counter ban, or do you leave both open? and then have to contend with the others. Seems like Flash Wolves are going to blink first. They ban away the Akali, and I agree with you. If Alistair's up, it's going to be picked. However, G2 have been happy with these Tom Kench drafts that can be pretty capable into it. They have an interesting Akali ban there for Flash Wolves joining Nocturne and Camille, but G2, I think, have to decide kind of between Alistar or Urgot. They already played against Alistar too soon. Kind of gave him the hands with it, Ooh. but it will be a Simba ban here. G2 going to leave kind of everything up here and just throw another Marksman ban into the mix. 
They are on the red side, so they will be able to effectively get themselves two strong picks. But I feel like the easiest pickup here for Flash was, oh, it's not going to be the Alistair. So now G2, they can grab that one for themselves, and they will likely grab the, the comfort pick in the top lane for Wonder. And it's a bit of a curious choice for me because Scion is up, and you could just take a tank into Urgot, but they're not willing to roll the dice. They're going to take the Urgot for themselves. They can take the Tom Kench side of the matchup, but definitely, based on the history of that Alistair pick, always been a big one for Sword Art. You're surprised to see it. I'm very interested to see what Betty plays next to the Tom Kench. The Varus is open and would be a power pick. Yeah, Varus and Kaiser. Kaiser's kind of the direction I'm looking at for G2 Esports. We heard on the analyst desk that all of the games today have been going extremely late and show for so much power in the late game fights we just saw in the Afrika matchup against G2. But if Flash Wars want that lane dominance, they can preemptively grab that Varus and guarantee themselves a strong 2v2. There is the Tom Kench as expected there for Sword Art. So opposite matchup this time for Wadid. And Mujin has looked pretty good on the aggressive jungles. I think Talia has been his best looking pick so far in the tournament. So they will consider it and they will lock it in. Oh, we, oh, no! Hyper Hyper Dinger. Open. we forgot about it. Oh no. But I didn't forget because I was watching a drop. I'm like, they already let it drop through. Maybe they don't want to play it. And then they insta lock it. So I'm wrong. Hyper it's Dinger. It's the tiebreaker game. G2, they go back to comfort. Wonder on Aatrox, we did on Alistair, and Hyanan on his undefeated Hyper Dinger. And if I've learned anything, if your back's against the wall, it doesn't matter if you have an undefeated champion if you're eliminated from the tournament. You got to put it out there. You got to put it on the world stage. I hope Tarzan's listening. That 12 0 trundle <laughs> didn't get them a win, didn't get them to worlds. But the Heimerdinger, it warps the game in such a massive way. And the mastery over it, we look over it. G2 do not. Well, there's a Jin ban. So G2 going to continue throwing a little bit of pressure down towards Betty. And LeBlanc also banned by Flash Wolves. You would imagine the Flash Wolves would look to take something like the Aurelia off the board. G2 Esports, they could look for a bit of AD damage in the middle lane. It's a comfort pick for Perks, and it's one of the strongest mid laners in the current meta. So to me, it would make sense that Flash was trying to take that one away. Can they give another AD champion that Perks is pretty good at? <laughs> uh, we'll see. <laughs> 10 seconds left for Flash Wolves. I don't know if we can have that much excitement in this tiebreaker <laughs> game if a Yasuo came out. Ban is going to be to the Zin Oh, just they left it open. Shut yeah. down Yankos, and, and you're right. That Perks. does mean Hyun and just going to snap it up for Perks. Look at the smile on his face. G2 very happy with how the draft is playing out right now. They do have the engage with the Alistair. They have damage. They have side lane threat. They can play with the 1-3-1. The Heimerdinger can hold on to the mid lane matchup as well. I feel like G2 are very comfortable with what they've got themselves. They feel like they have the Bonanza. Unless we see Flash will show us something different, as this would be That's different. different. Yes, We're would. going more to Kaiser bot lane here to try to deal with the Heimerdinger. That's going to be really a, a double bruiser lane here, most likely. Outside chances of Mordecai's a mid lane. I know that was played earlier in the year in the LMS, so we'll wait and see just to get the full information, but very likely to be one of these off-tank kind of bruiser mages in the bot lane and the Rise to come through for Maple. Yeah, looks like Rise indeed will be the selection there for Flash Wolves. Betty already playing a couple of games on that Mordecai. I thought we were past the Mordecai and Meta Vedius, but so did I. Heimerding has brought him back. This is a, a hard lane to conceptualize when you just think about it in term, in simple terms. Yeah, I mean, one thing we know about Mordecai is that he does push a lot as one of his big strengths. And also, when he's in that duo, he actually still gets the full experience as well, which is why he is so valuable down in the two versus two. But against the Heimerdinger and an Alistair, I'll be honest, gents, this is not a matchup I'm familiar <laughs> with. So it's going to be a learning experience for me. I think for everyone at this point. But uh, these are the lock-ins for these teams, as you can see. Only three seconds left for any swaps, and I'm pretty sure we're not getting any. Last pick, Gragas there for Yankos. I like as well. It's very comfortable. It's very stable champion. He certainly needs that after the loss they just suffered. Now, my only concern for the side of Flash Wolves is that Hanabi, throughout this tournament, has found most consistency when he puts himself on Sion. When he's forced into these carry v carry matchups, he can often fall behind. And when Wonder gets his hand on this big, powerful Aatrox pick, you would imagine that he'll look to pressure and force Hanabi down during the laning phase. And will he be able to have the same team fight value that he's had so much? On that side. And even though this world has indicated that consistently it's been the Urgot winning the Aatrox matchup, we've definitely had counterpoints. There definitely is some skill involvement here. So I'm very excited to see which way the lane goes and whether the jungle is going to be largely about influencing top lane or trying to salvage a Heimerdinger situation. I feel like the first early levels here will be so intriguing to watch on the bot lane. 
have to agree, but we'll find out in just a moment. One of these teams is playing their last game at Worlds here. The second slot in this group is on the line. You now, what you want it to be, given that both these teams at different points would have had an opportunity to play for first. But you don't come to this tournament to go home early. At this point, you'll take it. Only one of these two teams can advance. Will it be the Flash Wolves, who again had a promising start but failed on? Or G2 have been hot or cold kind of all year long as everything culminates in a lot of comfort for both these sides and one final game and a four-man invade in bot lane. And it's probably going to be a game about bot lane one way or the other. CG2 coming in four-man strong, just using the turret building to give information about what's going on in the brush. Whoever gets the minion wave first can be oh so important in Mordekaiser lanes. If you look at this bot lane summoners, runes, etc., we do have the Exhaust Ignite summoners for a potential all-in. They also have Glacial Augment Tom Kench for chase down. Can be very useful early game, pre-level six, chasing onto the Alistair and Guardian for a bit of extra health onto the Tom Kench. Over in Korea, actually Katie Rolster, surprisingly, yes. one of the best teams running around with the Mordecai. So that was Mord Orn, the Bruise Bros, as we like to call it. <laughs> we got some pseudo Bruise Bros here, and we have a late invade by Flash Wolves. I feel like Ghost Porter may have seen some people, but not entirely sure as Flash Wolves also sticking four men together for this late invade, as you mentioned. So G2 will stick their duel in early in the bot side, but Flash Rolls will look to steal away a buff. Yankos already over to the other side of the enemy jungle, though. Seems like they're splitting the map here. Maybe they're happy with vertical jungling because it means there's no backup for Heimerdinger and Alistair if there ends up being some bot lane plays. At worst, it will give Pjornan and Wadid some pause, knowing that for now at least, Yankos is going to be jungling almost exclusively on the top side. But it will give Pjornan and Wadid early priority on the wave, and you can see the push is in full effect from this Heimerdinger. I'm excited to see how well Betty and Solek will be able to hold their own in this lane. And as you identified, uh, Papa Smithy, this is a big bruiser bot lane, and their ability to stick to the targets is what I think is so strong, uh, especially once Betty completes a couple of items. You imagine that a Rhyalize is going to come through somewhere later on in the draft, but I think the focus for Hyanin is just farm, farm, farm. He's very reliant on getting things like the Lost Chapter before he really commits to any big trade. Even the skill order can be a little bit all over the place from Mordekaiser. W Max was the most uh, often, but the Cone, the E, was also can be taken just to try to push the turrets and try to poke them from range because once level six comes around two melee champions have no fun at all when that evolved turret comes down and makes life a bit of a hell can certainly be tough as we did see perks and maple trading a little bit there good stun there from hyana though does get the laser charge up but he kicks sword out of the way polarizes betty for a bit of extra trade damage and sword out eats a turret and it's going to spit it out towards Wadid. Ideally, Wadid just wants to headbutt Betty every time he tries to approach the wave with his W on to stop him building up any of his passive of the shielding here, as you see, just time and time again, because keeping up full shield is so important for Betty to just be able to ignore all the annoying chip damage from the turrets. Yeah, the wave clip from Betty is actually pretty significant. And Again, we talked about the shared experience not affecting Betty. He's now hit that level three mark, and he has control of the wave as Yan and has no turrets left. So Mordekaiser so far feeling pretty comfortable in these early levels, but also want to keep our eyes on the junglers as well. You talked a little bit about it, Papa Smithy, the fact that G2, they had to go up towards the top side, given that their blue was invaded upon. Yankos is actually making his way down towards the bot side of the map, and right now, very little vision has been invested from Flash Wolves to protect this pushing Mordekai. And also, they're going to need some jungle help, because if Wooded goes in, he might not get out. And speaking of Wooded... Yep, does get a good flash double pop. Going to kick one back at Sorta. They're trying to grab, but he does flash out of the way. Yankos with a double belly bop. He's going to get two, but Sorta with the devout is able to save Betty. I'm able to get away there. They expend the flash to make it happen, which could be the sort of thing Tom Kench can prey upon. They believe Talia's bot side. Good read by G2, so they don't go any further. But no kill can be picked up by the side of G2's bot lane. But he had a couple of summoner spells, though. The flash is gone from Sword Art. Betty has to use his exhaust. Well, did trace his flash to set up that play initially. But I like the proactivity from Yankos. We heard from Deficio. Is this the kind of player that can make the mental reset happen already? in this early game, he's trying to play around the duo that won their first game at Worlds. G2 letting their solo lane stay pretty stable, as you can see. Wonder and Hanabi has been pretty even on CS. Hanabi just trying to get as many shots as he can. Wonder doing a nice job getting the lockdown, but slight level lead right now for Hanabi means that Wonder can't really do too much more after using all his cooldowns, but he's gonna go back at another knockup here. Does feel like it's kind of a losing battle versus Ogot because he just always seems to get more health back. 
one of the advantages that Wonder has is he saw the jungler of Mujin down towards the bot side of the map. And the thing about this matchup is many pros will say that for uh, the Aatrox to be able to win out, he needs to use his abilities aggressively. And you can't do that if the jungler is obviously playing around the top side of the map. So having that extra information allows him to play safe as we see more skirmishing down bar. Another good stun by Kyanen. They're actually going to keep going for it. Ready, available to be devoured by Sword Art, but Garnon gonna keep him at bay with his turrets. Couch being up so important, otherwise Sword Art might go aggressive and the Ignite is still up on his side. I think you got the right read there, Red Vedius on the top side. For now at least, Wonder is able to manalously trade, not worry about the enemy jungler, and overall just being able to out-resource Hanabi. But as lane goes on and some shops come in, maybe the texture of the lane will morph a bit. Speaking of, not too sure exactly what's going on in bot lane, but it does feel like Modicarizer was able to, again, using that experience, uniqueness in the bot lane, and also just some generally good pushing power is at least keeping them back towards their turret, although the CS is staying even. Perks also dancing around, looks for a quick stun on some Abel, but does not grab it. But again, gets out safely without taking too much in the trade. Imagine he's a couple of minions away from level six, which is why he made that play. And yes, discussed with the ping as we mention it. Perks happy to bide his time, has the ignite in this lane, no cleanse coming through. Very much focused on the solo kill. It's one way to lead your team from the front. That's the way that Perks always seems to try to lead G2. Yeah, he was a big carry early in the day. His Akali was why they were able to get that comeback win against PvB. His Lissandra not quite as impactful in their earlier game against the Flash Walls. But now that he is back on a carry, I feel like that he's back in his wheelhouse. He's in a position to lead his team to the quarterfinals for the first time in G2 Esports history. But there is still a very angry Flash Wall standing in their way as we see a bit of jungle attention down towards the bot side. See what can get done here by Mujin. Yankos also in the area near the blue buff. But Talia just going to walk in and check it again. Pushing bot lane. Gives him a lot of freedom. Vanguard's edge onto Maple. Perks <laughs> apparently just showing off. We'll call it a uh, zoning ultimate Yeah, we'll do that. Just wanted to see. Just try. Realized he was under turret, so wasn't going to make any plays. It's kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't with Mujin in particular, because you always want to come bot lane either to gank or poke away the turrets. Speaking of it, which Again, when he kicks away Betty with that shed shield on. Perks again going in on to Maple, but he already used his ulti. Good amount of damage, both running low on mana as well. So Perks just trying to be a nuisance. Maple doing pretty well in the 1v1 though. Even after Perks is playing as aggressively as he is, he stayed even in farm and he's able to pick up his tier as well. He did use his TP earlier on in the matchup, but now Yankos is actually hanging around. He's just getting a bit of vision towards the bot side, but Mujin is here to help with the wave clear as well. No mana, so just a recall timing for Maple. That's gonna be something Perks can take advantage in to get a good recall of his own. It might be Hextring or Merc Treads the first purchase. Top lane is completely even, so eight minutes in, no closer to knowing if it'll be G2 or Flash Wolves joining Aatrox. Joining a freak of freaks. It's been a long day already. Aatrox. In the next round. And what a crazy day it has been as well, because when you kind of look at how things have played out, G2, for all intents and purposes, should have been knocked out of this group. And if it wasn't for PvB bringing in their sub jungler, finding the upset win against Flash Wolves and giving G2 this other opportunity, it would be Flash Wolves locking in that quarterfinal. And I think we actually have to talk about the fact that the Drake did not go to the side of the Mordekaiser team. When we had that Mordekaiser meta earlier in the season, we understood that if the Mordekaiser team was able to monopolize Drake, get the Ghost Spirit down, suddenly those turrets quiver in fear. Just a single breath from the Drake, you take the turret and you rotate from there. If you lose the Mordekaiser Ghost, if you can't pick up any of the Drakes, it does slow down the advance and makes Flash Wars much more accountable in the 2v2. And I will say that I like the G2 are at least drawing people down to the bot sides. It's giving perks more agency to play aggressive. And this is Tian Ring Wadid's wheelhouse. Just play in the bot side, try not to die, and absorb whatever pressure comes your way. Yankos, though, also been pretty active alongside Mujin, but first blood still available for the taking as Hanabi is roaming. And this might even be a lane swap here. Ooh. Seen this once already from Flash Wolves. So he sees a Negatron cloak purchase come out of perks, might be a delayed wits end later. And they just say, okay, that's, you know, the better part of 750 gold spent on magic resist. That's lane swap. But speaking of lane swaps, though, perks and Yankos are looking for a gank up top. Maple looking like a tasty target. This is apparently the solution. You lane swap with me, we dive you under the tower. Well done to pop Yankos with the belly bump. Vanguard's edge. We and perks surfs in for first blood. Gotta love it when a plan comes together. Attempt made by Flash Wolves, but that little caveat 
of there being a roam opportunity from Perks allows them to pick up the first blood and no answering kills available for Flash. But now Mujin heads towards the bot side of the map. Mordekaiser, another champion that's really great at setting up these dives. And now with three members towards the bot side and no response from the G2 top half of the map, Flash will be able to zone Hyanan and did away from a full wave of farm. Nice job there, but Hyanan actually just picked up one with a grenade, so barely able to clip one as I watch this one again. Despite being seen in vision, Maple, not much he can do here. I don't believe he saw it, given that he actually all walked forward for another CS, but by the moment it was fully revealed. There was only going to be one result. Perks picks up the kill, which will definitely accelerate his build. Flash Wolves are feeling so pressured around the bot side, but nice little pathing for a counter gank by Yankos. Forces Mujin out and means no change in the 2v2. So slight early game goal lead going in favor of G2. G2 are going to continue with the standard matchups that they've been given now with Hanabi now playing up against Perks. That hasn't changed his aggressive tendencies. And interestingly, Yankos is actually just investing everything towards the bot side of the map. Mujin is still here and Yankos needs to respect that. So I nice. tried for a flash play, but the proactive flash there and the body slam is going to be easy enough to announce it. That's a... Uh, that seems like a nervous play by Sword. He's trying to play and make, he's trying to take advantage of the three hit passive, but doesn't find anything. And good result by Yankos to just know I'm out of here. Don't want anything bad to potentially happen. So let's get a summoner out of Sword Art as a result. And it looks like the dual lanes will be resetting in just a moment as Hyun Ringwood did to push that last wave in. And I think that when we kind of look at the compositions as a whole, I think it's fair to say that both sides have the options to play the 1-3-1 one, one, or 1-4 one, style of setup, but as well, both have strong team fighting capabilities. And you think about Heimerdinger and Mordekaiser in a team fight, the surprising amount of tankiness that a Mordekaiser can bring and the amount of self-sustain that he has with things like the Gunblade completed versus the amount of turret damage that a Heimerdinger can bring along with the amount of AOE CC that can shift the course of a fight. And the issue I see for Flash Wars moving forward is that if G2 can keep up their early game late, can grow it, get a few thousand gold ahead, and stick a vision advantage. Walking into the turrets, or whether it's three of them or the upgraded turret, as this very short range team, they're basically melee all the way through, no true ranged auto attacker, is going to be almost impossible. Yes, Mordekaiser in the lane, and especially if he gets the Drake Spirit, can push through the lane and trivialize Heimerdinger's impact. But as the game goes on, it's going to be trickier as topside. 1v1 here, starting off, TP in from G2, going to make it an unfair fight. Perks, there's no one to get himself executed, but he's looking for the solo kill, able to grab it. Didn't even need the TP in his bot side. Still some action brewing. Mujin here, ready with the ulti, but does not pull the trigger. Beautiful stuff there from Perks as he finds himself a solo kill. Hanabi is struggling right now in this lane. We talked about how he would be able to perform on the Urgot, and right now things are not looking good in the early game. If you opt into the skill matchups in situations like this, you look a bit silly. That was against the Negatron, but now wit's end of the Aurelia. Oh, couldn't prime, no counter kill available. The rich get richer when it comes to perks, and for Hanabi, He's just left li trying to pick up the piece. And you mentioned it, that dodge of the ultimate from Perks is really what shifted the fight in his favor because if that lands, Hanabi can feel much more confident in committing to the fight, knowing that if he can just get Perks to that benchmark, that is a guaranteed kill. But he uses his Q eligantly, and he walks away with a solo. And here's G2 transferring some of that pressure that Perks has generated here to the bottom side of the map. Where he's actually going to start the dive up, pops Unbreakable Will. Here comes the dive, Wunder down here as well, looking for Betty, who is going to flash away. So that taking a little too much damage, but Hanami is here. Unfortunately for Betty, he is not, as Wunder does finish off that kill. Bit of a cleanup crew here for G2. They can't get a second kill just yet. Sword Art in the rush, but they do can't get him in time as he actually Abyssal Voyages out towards G2's turrets. But he wants it. Flash, auto blast cone, Zordat's booking it in towards the base as fast as his little legs will go. Wadid has bloodlust in his eyes, he's going after Zordat, he does have the boots of mobility, I don't know if he can catch up though. I don't think so, I think Zordat has successfully executed, indeed has done so, Wadid <laughs> just uh, <laughs> celebrates by uh, dinging the cowbell. Gotta give him the cowbell when scenarios like that, G2 went for the turret up, I assume they would just use the ult to try to represent turret damage. I often see Hyun and just drop the ultimate and see how the enemy reacts, but they go for the full-on dive because Wonder is coming down, as we can see. The play starts off innocently enough, but the moment that Wonder is able to walk down, well, it starts to engage, and while they don't get the maximum, it's another positive play by G2. It certainly is, and they're even able to get the teleport out from the Urgot as well, and what a great casket from Yankos. His early game has been sublime. 
finding a lot of good opportunities, been involved in a lot of the early kills, and things are starting to devolve for Flash Wars in the early game. This Aurelia perks in a side lane is extremely strong with a fully completed item and the team off the back of that. Wonder is picking up early kills and up against Hanabi, it feels like that he's the one with the pressure advantage in Flash Wars. Now with the Rift Tower looking to finally get some control back on the map. And while usually we focus on the Rift Tower taking a turret, I want to see them find a way to get this Infernal Drake and get that, get that first Ghost out of the Mordecai's, who might be getting pincered here. By throwing Maple, barely able to flash out of the body slam from Yankos, who did expend the flash as well. But still, that ever-important Drake is available for both these teams. G2, do you want to try and fight for it? Chains latch, but only hit Hanabi, who's pretty tanky at this stage of the game. We see that Kyanin is still pushing out bot. Perks will ideally like to push this mid lane out, but Rise versus Aurelia, you've got to respect the range disadvantages that you're at, meaning that Flash Wars will be able to move back through the river, try and reclaim some vision control before the Drake kicks off. This is probably only possible because Heimerdinger is showing. Obviously, if he was in the river, he'd be setting up a turret line that Flash Wars are not set up to walk through. They're giving up and seeding control around the Drake. Let's see if they can actually find an angle of approach, because for now, this seems seems like G2's to pick up. Yeah, Wadid is trying to play defense, but the Drake will go down more than fast enough. G2 do pick up their second Drake of the game and again deny it from the mod. And they're showing a lot of control but mid. Yep, looking for it here. Perks does get the disarm. Vanguard Dead's already there and Wonder just there on looking. Does get an assist but Perks basically did that himself. It's looking too easy to try to take down this Urgot who's getting rotated on despite being one of the most contested picks in the entirety of Worlds. Maple in the meantime picks up some farm but to what end? And you can see that Perks really wants this. For the last th two years, G2 have failed to qualify out of the groups, often being considered one of the favorites to make it into the quarterfinals. But with a new roster this year, with only perks remaining in this quarterfinal matchup, he sits on a 3-0-0 Aurelia against the Flash Wolves, and G2 as a team are looking for more. He's the franchise player, and right now he is playing like it, as G2 will actually get themselves the trade in turret. This Yanan puts the final candy cane on that one. Flash Wars did get the extra gold, but G2 are actually up 3,000 gold thanks to those kills. And of course, they have the two Drakes that are not reflected in the gold lead either. It feels like everything comes together when they when Hyonan gets to lock in the Heimerdinger. Looked over it earlier in the day, but was not going to look over it in an elimination match for his team. They have great uh, diversification of damage because they also have perks and wonder to provide more of the AD threat. So for now, Flash Wars already feels like they're being pushed into a corner that's very difficult to get back in. We already alluded to the fact that losing vision control against this Heimerdinger comp can be so woeful for a Mordekaiser carry team. And we're very, very close to that scenario playing out. And I also feel that for the Flash Walls, due to their limited engage options, they need to be setting up around these objectives first. And it ties in with your vision point, but the fact that the Flash Wars have no way to easily start a fight outside of having an objective and the fact that they fell behind in this early game and aren't able to set up around it means that the ways in which they come back are kind of relying on G2 to make these mistakes, relying on them to commit to a Baron and maybe finding a fight, relying on them to overextend. Otherwise, slowly, G2 will gain more and more control. European fans should definitely be confident about the position their team is right now, but we know how quickly those scenarios can change. That's very true. It feels like G2 control their own destiny, as all Flash Wars can do is plonk down some control wards and hope G2 comes to them. If you've learned anything today, though, Papa, fates turn real quick. Investor ones here, especially when so much is on the line. G2, though, I'm trying to get things pushing through the midsection. Hyanan is doing his typical thing of hanging out in mid lane and pressuring some turrets. But he doesn't have much to care about, just falling in with what Betty has said. He sees Mordecai as a Tom Kench. Eh, the Tully is showing, <laughs> but not going to be all inning onto Hyanan in the backline stuff. Watch available, level two ultimate available. So he's happy to be there, monopolize solo experience and gold. G2, in the meanwhile, just claim the blue buff, just play it all standard, and there's very little Flash Wolves can do yeah. to impact this damn Heimerdinger. Yeah, it's like quietly one be doing this lane at this point, as we did. We'll actually return to the mid lane and again uh, cheer on his lane mate by dinging the cowbell once more. Pacey Time, do you remember the last time we cast Heimerdinger in an elimination game? Do I ever? It was six years ago, but <laughs> yeah, damn, was that a good thing? Ago. That was Mandu, baby. Poo Mandu on wow. the jungle yeah, Heimerdinger. Right. That's a throw at jungle Heimerdinger? That was a YouTube video that got a lot of hits. Oh, yeah. You can watch that one later. Let's focus on the fate of Europe and the LMS right now. But uh, the irony is not lost on me. No, and there's the big turret from Yarnin. 
This was not around last time we cast this champion, but uh, turret damage is still good. So let's chip away, and again, Hyana can rinse repeat. Basically, if this holding pattern stays, G2 should be happy. And see, ooh, Perks once again looking for pressure. TP's in, Abyssal Voyage. Perks maybe a bit too far. Good flash over the wall. Yankos there, but here's wanted to try and play cleanup on the other end of the fight. Wadid's come over as well. Is the fight looking decent? Betty is going to get chained up, but does flash the wall to safety. A bit of a messy fight there from Perks as he initiates before his team is ready to follow up. Unfortunately, Yankos' barrel could offer the disengage, but neither team could really commit due to the awkward situation that they were in. And the sort of scenario where snowballing in the early game allows you to spare your blushes a little bit ends up being a trade of summoners between Perks and Betty, but they crucially get the objective, and that's the more important thing. We're able to look at the top of the screen and remind you, we already mentioned G2 being stuck at groups a couple of years in a row. Flash Wars, for all their heroics at MSI and all that we built up around this team, they look so comfortable coming into the day, but it's 2015 since they got out of the group stage. And you think about how both these teams started this group stage. Flash Wars off to a dominant performance. G2 very quick to catch up, and many considered Afrika not being able to bounce back. But after their 3-0, it is now both these teams with so much hope in their eyes to make it further in the World Championship than I have to fight for that final spot. Well, we're about to have something spicy come up in the Dragon Pit in 50 seconds. Infernal number two is ready. And again, the Mordekaiser team has not gotten a single Drake so far in G2. Well, it might be nice to get yourself an objective and deny it away from the enemy team. You're still stacking Drakes at this point as well. I mean, G2 is just plain sailing. I think Bedius and I have to think about you just look at the page and see CS lead for Aatrox, CS lead for Aurelius, yep. CS lead for Heimerdinger, and map control in general. We already outlined the low engage. To me, it's just go back, buy nine control wards, and try <laughs> to make the enemy come to you, because these scenarios don't seem to be suiting flat. Oh, missed again. Perks, though, he's getting chased down, but he's going to have to zip back to the wave, <laughs> and he's out. Ooh, kind of. Mugen's here. It was a voyage in. Perk, going to have to play some real theatrics to try and get out of this situation. <laughs> Cannot do it, though. It's shut down by Mujin, but it's worth a mid turret. But they even bring in the uh, Abyssal Voyage just for a front row seat to Perks finally dying. Flash Wars feel good about that, but they lose the mid lane turret, and it doesn't change the state of the map. But look at the pings. Flash Wars realize the situation that they're in. With Perks gone, one of the main gold holders of G2, Flash Wars are just going to force the Baron. That ward to the left of Baron, though, may give G2 the information they need to really put a stop to this play. Kianan throwing in grenades, here's Wadid in the mix of the fight. Kianan just trying to poke them out of the way. And again, they're going to try and go for it here. Wadid a little too low, but they do get the pick up on Hanabi. Maple trying to flank around, but now Kianan's going to face tank for his jungler as Wunder with the World Ender. Still looking decent there. Oh, the knock was almost there, but he didn't oh! have the third. They will take down Maple, now Wunder has to book it. But he's still safe for now. Mujin Flash Q will pick up. The cap on that kill. And Perks just won't die. He's the biggest <laughs> traitor to G2 as he's so close to killing what did. But G2, they actually stop the Baron. They find two kills. Ends up being overall two for two if you count the loss of life of Perks. But for now, G2, they hold the line and Flash Wolves aren't able to get anything back. And we finally saw that sliver of hope for Flash Wolves. Finally, G2 had to come to them in an outnumbered situation. However, it could only delay the Drake take. It still is terrain controlled by G2. So Hyanan and Yankos take down the second Inferno for G2. Continue stacking their advantages as we watch this one again. And the thing for Flash Wars is, remember that Rise isn't even in this fight yet. They have Perks as a ghost, and Wadid, he's pretty separated from the rest of his team, but Hyanan isn't untouched. The fact that Wanda can get into the thick of things is great for G2, but Mujin is sitting on the back line. Maple then arrives. The problem is, the rest of Flash Wolves have to commit to killing this turret before they can really kill the rest of G2. And then they realize that there is a very fed and strong Aatrox in our face that is just too difficult to deal with. And Maple's really in that unenviable situation of, do I try to be another frontliner for my team that's already overloaded with those, or flank and force Hyarnan to disengage? He makes the secondary choice in the end. It's a bit of a line ball as to whether it's the right call, but speaking of right calls for G2, the pressure is still on. Ulti there from Sword Art again, but very defensive to try and save this turret. Going on again with the grenades, just gonna keep the siege going here for G2. Gold lead still looking pretty strong, they're up about 3,500 as they're building in towards their second items for the most part. But still really yet to break this game wide open, Baron being available is always nice. G2 stacking Drakes is good as well, but game is bounced pretty precariously, Vedius. Now, there are no TPs anywhere on the map right now, and wonder he could be caught out. Realm Warp, gonna look for him. 
Well, then the pop tries to get out of there, pops the chain, doesn't have flash. That's going to be a kill. You have to think the resurrect is there. Can he make it over the wall? He's not even going to try as Maple. Able to finish that off. And I was about to mention one of the few things G2 can't do is walk up as a single member, because that's really all Flash Wars are able to put together. Their team comp to do is kill the one person in the front. They want to focus on a Rune Prison, the Urgot ult, and the Mordekaiser ult to make it a 6v4 fight with the Ghost. In this case, they're able to do that just too far forward from what has been caught a couple of times today after what was such a flawless performance earlier in Worlds 2018. It doesn't change the game, but they still have to reset as Maple. Yankos with a big play. Doesn't quite get him over the wall with the cask. And the rockets don't quite reach. Garnum wasn't quite in range to help secure that kill. Ends up just being a flash for flash overall, but a flash just rise could be big for G2 in the ensuing fight. But as you said, Papa Smith, you wonder, making another big mistake like we saw earlier in the day, and Flash Wolves, they want to try and capitalize on that as much as possible, as right now they lose another turret. There's your true zoning ult this time, Papa Smithy, and they do get the turret. You gotta do what you gotta do, and what this gets G2 getting the inner turret is, remember how they closed out that game against Afrika? Get all the lanes pushing in, all the turrets are barren, turn on the barren and kill it surprisingly quickly. They may not be mountains, but two infernals are a great path to make that happen. And the longer the lanes, the deeper you can get lane vision onto the side of flash walls with the aforementioned difficulty of them walking up to the Heimerdinger comp, the more it's likely to pay dividends for G2. Munda is ready with the TP, so is Hyanam, but of course he's busy around the mid lane, trying to bait that barren as you mentioned. Wonder actually gonna take some time to get these cards away. And again, G2, I think have done a great job resetting this game in general. Yankos in particular has played a much different game than the one he had to play. Yes, he was forced to some awkward situations, but full credit to Yankos for shaking it all off and playing really strong League of Legends. Credit to Mujin as well. He's currently the one of the big gold holders on the side of Flash Wars right now. And given that he has completed the Morello Nomicon, he's also one of the big damage dealers that G2 have to respect. Remember that they don't have any real frontline tanks outside of Wadid, and even then, he doesn't have that much gold. So for the side of Flash Wars, the fact that Mujin is still strong, Betty will be a pseudo tank and that he can absorb a lot of damage with his shielding means that Flash Wars in these fights still have a means of coming back if they can just find the right fight against G2. I just think at this point it is very much about sticking to their identity of having Wonder bot lane drawing one, drawing two, and every few moments what did is uniquely qualified to face check this blue buff area and say no control wards for you, no deep vision for you and just keep resetting until the Baron becomes a realistic start. It doesn't feel like we're there yet, but I think G2 trying to ARAM once again or run together as a five plays into Flash Wars finding a single pick. We've already outlined multiple times today that if they try to play and try to aggress onto G2, that's where Flash Wars draft does fall apart. And throw back to game one of the group stages, or the first time rather G2 met up against the Afrika Freaks. When G2 played around the Baron, they leveraged Heimerdinger's turrets to maintain aggro, slowly dish out damage, while Wonder split pushed off on a sideline. It ties back to what you were saying. We're yet to see G2 utilize this Heimer's strength when playing around this big objective. Small difference here is that Kiana's actually required to push mid lane. He does it the fastest of the available champions because of the Aurelia drop. So it becomes more three lanes than two. But that's a lot of darkness. There's no Nocturne. This is just a lack of information for Flash Wars. And that's why the turrets mean this Baron buff start number one. And they've started it. But again, they can very easily pull off and try and turn this around. Hanabi not going to get stunned, but Soda is going to be the target in the front line. The Tomcat is going to get picked off here. Kjarnan able to slay the first beast. And now Wunder looking for the knockout, doesn't quite grab Batty, but he will get him with a second. Still going, finds a chance, Vanguard then disarms three, and Perks, he's gonna dance around the backside of the fight as G2 look to really put the screws in this game. Hanabi is gonna just stay now, but that's two kills for G2. And G2 finally start off the Baron, bait Flash Wolves into a choke point, and find a massive fight. Wunder's gonna go back to base because he knows he has the teleport, but Mujin is still alive. G2 posturing back towards the Baron, have to respect the potential of a steal. All the big wins are going to be gotten around Baron. They're back onto it. As you mentioned, Vedius, they started off and it doesn't look like Flash Wars can really do anything. Moonton, no ult, no flash, no real way to get into the pit in time. So it may just have to be Constellation Drake instead as Maple just TP's down to try and pressure this turret and meet his team up for the objective. And this is a uh, very, very little reward, but all they can do is take a Mountain Drake and reevaluate the game state. 
as Flash Wars. Feels like the early game Drake's going the way of G2 was so important to trivializing Mordecai's ability to kind of face roll over a game with those Dragon Spirits. Now the Baron is there. Now Flash Wars are just going to have to play on the pure defensive and walking up as this Mordecai's a comp is probably an impossibility for now. Still going as well here, Wunder. Fancy's a Nogamon and Mujang gonna have to pop. Ulti does do so, instantly gets resurrected as Yankos does try and disengage him. Wunda also forced a flash there. Another big mistake from Wunda as his ultimate was just about to come up. Unfortunately, he gets it before the rest of Flash Rolls collapse. But Piper Smith, you talked about it earlier. If they're a single target, Flash Rolls have enough crowd control and damage to just obliterate. I just learned that Wunda likes to puff his chest out and look as intimidating <laughs> as possible. But being turned on him a couple of times, Stick with what you're doing majorly here, G2. Just play out the percentages. No need to get cute. You're in a huge advantage, and this Heimerdinger is obnoxious to deal with from the side of Flash Wolves. But when it comes to True Siege, they don't feel super confident, or super confident, I should say. And for now, at least, they go back to pushing out minion waves and making this a three-lane game. And again, Kyanan's Heimer is comfort. Wunder maybe playing a little too overeager, and Yankos is Short up a lot of what we've seen in his mistakes earlier in the tournament. But Perks, again, he's the first to level 18. He's been styling on most of this game, apart from that one death he took isolated in the top lane. He had a great caster game last game, despite the loss to Afrika. It does not surprise me that I assume the captain of G2 is really looking to rally his team into this quarterfinal. I got to say, the hard counter to Mordecai is definitely Baron Buff. He walks up <laughs> and damages the minions. He's like, well, sorry, guys, I tried. Well, G2 now, they're pushing on all three lanes. Flash Wolves, their hopes of making it to a quarterfinal are quickly disappearing as G2 pressure towards the base. Lane assignment here is fantastic. Nothing more than Tom Kench can do. Aatrox is being able to shrug off rise damage and poke at that top inhibitor turret as well. G2 staying as a three-man unit and perks. Well, everyone's staying away from him wherever possible. But the problem is, normally you'd say, okay, Orn, blow that Orn horn. They don't have anything like that. So incrementally, they're chipping down every inhibitor turret and Flash Wars not finding anything. It's not going to take long for G2 to find themselves 10,000 gold up and one of these inhibitor turrets broken, if not multiple, perhaps even at the same time. Still 50 seconds left on this Baron. Kyanan is peppering the front line of Flash Wars, or at least what is of it with rockets, and that turret's gonna fall down and G2 move in. And this must mean so much to G2 as Perks. Now trying to get collapsed onto two yeah, members. He's just gonna start his way out of this play. Perks does pop it. Actually, he moves through the Ogot ulti. Can't make his way back in, but Wanda's gonna try and finish up the kill. Perk still playing around Hanami. He's dancing through this he He's actually still living. He's trying to find what? the biggest 1v1. He will fall, but the rest of his team is playing clean up with a plum. And G2, they find a big fight. Both Betty and Maple are down. The Nexus Towers are in their eyes. They still have the Baron buff. They are so close to making their first ever quarterfinal. Indeed, under the turret is going to initiate onto Sorta. That's a kill. They're going to take the Nexus turret down. They grab the right hand side. The stopwatch prop for Wanda is going to try and buy just a bit more time. Kyan and Timer is doing what he can. Just hit the Nexus everything point. out. Hanabi pops the stone plate. G2, they're going to get another kill here as the Ergon cannot defend. And and G2 on the precipice of pushing to their first quarterfinals. They put the last finishing touches on the Nexus and push themselves into the top eight. The faces of elation on G2. Perks has struggled for so long. 2016, he failed. 2017, he failed. And 2018, after losing Sven and Mithy, bringing in Jan and Unwadid, and it is the Heimerdinger pick that brings him to his first ever quarterfinal. He must be so proud of what he and his team have finally accomplished after all this time. And just like we've said multiple times this tournament, they did it their way. And it took them a long winding road. They qualified through the play-ins as you have to see the disappointed faces of the Flash Wolves once again unable to push through the group's stage into the quarterfinals. That means that C9 and now G2 have gone through the play-ins and made it to the quarterfinals. That's what I like to see. One NA and one EU team sneaking their way out of group somehow. Credit to G2. A very strong passage of League of Legends in what looked like a pretty tough group. And some crazy games settle in another EU tiebreaker, which they continue to do well in. It was very competitive group A. Flash Wars had a fantastic performance. Overall, their year has been one of the best.
but G2 come out on top. The crowd shows their support. And G2 Esports, once again, for the first time in the organization's history, will make the quarterfinals. And they're definitely a team that, if you're a first seed, I'm not sure you want to face. You might say, OK, get rid of the Heimerdinger, get rid of some of the tools, and maybe they won't have more. But I have a feeling they're going to use the next couple of days to come up with a few more strategies. Some people call them cheese. I call them dark technology. <laughs> and that sort of technology did propel them to the quarterfinals. It's all beautiful League of Legends to me, Papa Smithy. But enough from us. Let's head over to World's Cooldown for a closer look at today's games. <laughs> the officials are happy, man. Welcome to World's Cool Down. After another day that tested expectations, G2. Oh, my they goodness. They get the victory to secure that second seed into the knockout stage, and they do it by returning to the Heimerdinger. And, and you at G2 placed second in the group. Uh, in the my start of the, day, right? the start of the day. Not in my yeah. World's Pickums, I will admit. But yeah, after yeah. seeing them hey, play so throughout the group second, stages, yeah, I, did make, so I did make that yeah. adjustment. We all got it right. We just yeah. got the first one wrong. The order we might have been a little bit out yeah, yeah, yeah. there. Afrika, man, they showed up today, too. We can't forget that. But G2 here right down the, you know, to the end. They pick up the victory. I think this draft was very intriguing because if yeah. you compare it to the first game that these two teams played against each other today, the Heimerdinger was left open there as well, yep. but G2 didn't pick it up. This time, they go back to it. We were trying to figure this out, and... Usually, if you're going to leave Heimerdinger up, especially after what happened to Afrika Freaks at the first game, you have something planned, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the first time this happened, G2 was thinking, okay, we don't know what it is, but... Le so they wouldn't just, do it if they away. didn't have something planned, yeah, so right. we'll just go elsewhere. But then, when their backs are completely against the wall, just like they did in the regional qualifier, you got to do it. You have to go with your best shot. Yes. And I don't feel like Flash Wolves ever does this if they don't think Mordekaiser smashes that lane, because the rest of this team comp is just terrible. Like, if they don't have, <laughs> if they don't have bot push, and if they can't control Dragon, they have almost no initiation other than teleporting your team behind someone. So, oh. fun little story here. The Mordekaiser pick, when they got locked in, uh, there were some tweets happening from some of the National League coaches in Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and one of them said, you know what? G2, they know everything about Mordekaiser. They spent a month scrimming National League teams who are playing Mordekaiser bot lane. So they're, Amazing. they're not going to be surprised. Now, obviously, we can't fully confirm this yet, right. but this is what, what's being said by some of these coaches. And what we saw in the laning phase, and I will just admit already, I'm not a Mordekaiser versus Heimerdinger expert, but what You're we not? did see... I'm not, not <laughs> yet. Uh, what we did see, which I think was smart, because it seemed to make sense, was whenever the three turrets were down from, uh, from Janen, and Mordekaiser would then put W on Tom Kench and walk into the middle of the lane with the turret. We did would just headbutt him away. Yeah. Not combo him, just headbutt him away. W would run out, the turret would stay alive for a little bit longer. And Mordekaiser tried to get push going multiple times, got it a few times, but not often enough. Right. Because when you play Morde, you want to get bot control into Drake, into turrets, and then we all go, wow, Mordekaiser, brilliant pick, yeah. how smart. If you don't get it, however, we're like, useless. Like, but but Flashwolves could never know that, right? This whole idea sure, sure. that that G two actually has practice around the pick of Mordekaiser with their own Heimer. Uh, it was amazing, and I I don't want to take credit away from G two because they still won both of the solo lanes, like they have done yeah, so yeah. many right. times in the past, even dating back to play in. And they did play the game with a lot of patience. The later it went, I felt like the more they realized how much they could actually just walk up to a turret and auto-attack it, yep. and how little recourse Flash Wolves actually had. Like, we criticize Flash Wolves so much for not drafting enough engage, and then their final team comp is Tom Kench, Mord, <laughs> Talia. Like, it, it, that hurt them so much. They trying, gambled. They, they gambled really hard. Yeah. Uh, which and you know what? Me. Respect for that as well, right? Yeah. Just as much as G2 went back to comfort, I do respect the gamble. And, hey, we got to try something different in order to put them on edge and maybe grab the victory. But it falls in favor of G2 this time around. And while the Heimer pick was incredible, I want to talk about just how much fun I had watching Perks on that Aurelia. Some incredible outplays. Multiple times dodging Urgot ults with either a, mm -hmm. a stasis <laughs> or a fly. You know, it was just incredible to watch him pilot that champion. And that's, you know, obviously the focus goes to bot lane. But as, as you highlighted, mm -hmm. Jed, and as you just said, here, like the two soul laners also got comfort picks. Yeah. Especially Relia for perks. We've also seen Wonder played. Like that's kind of the big thing, big thing for me in this draft where I felt like earlier today, Flash was tried to take away a lot of picks from G2 and say, we're gonna deny you comfort. This draft, they were like, we will give you everything you have actually succeeded on so far. Also the Heimerdinger. Mm -hmm. And Perks showed if you don't have a good pick against him specifically, he gets the early kills. And Hanabi on Urgot, 
was not the answer for Flash. Because, <laughs> no. yeah, there were some dodges, but some of those ultis were also flying left and right. To say the least. To give us some pro insight on how that tiebreaker played out, though, we're going to send it over to Shox and G2's victorious mid laner. Thank you very much, guys. I'm here with Perks. After one hell of a day and after three years, you have finally made it to World's Quarterfinals. What is your first reaction? Well, my first reaction, to be very honest, I'm, I don't know how to feel because it's like, I feel like we could have been like first seed. So that was like, I'm like so ungrateful. I don't know, I'm really grateful they made out, but like my feelings, like my feelings only one was like, wow, we could have been first seed, you know, if I just maybe played a bit better. Like the Castle game, I was, I was really like, I set myself to carry the game alone with the injury draft. Like it was like really meant for me to carry and we didn't win, so I felt like a bit bad. But I knew we could win against Lashles. Even like the game before, if we just won against Lashles, we would have made it out first as well. Uh, overall, I'm just super happy that we didn't make it out. It's after such a like, to be honest, kind of disappointing year. Uh, we picked it up at the end. We are playing better than ever, right? And we are having very close games and winning games against the best teams in the world. So. This is something I would probably not expect when we lost quarterfinals. I didn't even expect we would even make it the Worlds. I thought it was just so fucking doomed, but now we are here and we are in quarterfinals and we are going to play against KT, RNG or IG. Maybe Fnatic. So, or maybe Fnatic. Actually, I would love to meet Fnatic. Yeah. That, will be, that will be hype. So it's going to be against very good teams and I think that we do have a chance of winning against them and upsetting. So. Of course, they are, they are the better than us, but we are the underdogs, and uh, I'm just really happy. Yeah, I mean, you answered everything that I was going to ask you. Uh, one thing I do want to talk about is that you talk about, you know, it was a hard year. When you think about it, isn't it odd or isn't it just interesting that you came to Worlds twice, you were in a super hard group with the best G2 roster, right? But you're still here, and you made it work with all these guys. What do you have to say about your new teammates and, and all the people around you that also made it happen? Um, they're just really fucking good and that we just like my teammates are really really good and they work work hard and they are like matching and beating the best in the world right so it's like we did a good choice with the roster and we it's paying off like in the long run right we didn't win but next year maybe you know I think we have a chance so yeah I still have like I still have to process everything you know uh, of course, I, I always want to do more, you know, but I just have to, I have to be happy with some things, you know, and right now this is like the first goal that I accomplish for myself and I just feel a bit relieved. So yeah, I, I don't I don't really know what to say, right? <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. I see that you're conflicted because you wish you had done more and you had that first seed. But I can tell you from everyone in EU and a lot of people watching that you guys played your hearts out in that last game when it mattered, when you were up against it and you overcame all the emotion and the stress. Is there one final thing you want to say? You're going to quarterfinals, finally! Um, well, I would like to thank to everyone who supported us. Uh, like, it really means a lot, like seeing supporting messages uh, when we are like new roster and we are struggling and people who like never didn't doubt us, especially after the 0 3 quarterfinals. That's like really like it really stinks, you know? <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's just, it's been great so far and Making it after three years out of groups is very nice, and I, I think that we we are not just done yet, you know. So they are not done just yet. Well, we've seen a lot already. Thank you very much, Perks. They're going to the quarterfinals. Whew. Back over to you guys. Thank you very much, Jack. See, I personally love that he's not satisfied with the second seed, right? I True. mean, he talks about how, yes, it's wonderful that we're going through, but he's already thinking about, you know, the ways that they could have achieved first and, and looking yeah. to, to better himself. It, it was actually the same story after the MSI final that Jiju played in 2017 when they got 3-1 by SKT. We came down after, like, hey, amazing, you guys made it to the final, it was a competitive series, and he was just mad. Right. He was like, wait, we could have beaten these guys, you know? And it's the same feeling from him now, and that is one of the reasons a guy like Perk stays at the top, Mm -hmm. Because he's never happy. He's always like, no, we can do more. We could, we can win harder. It's still kind of crazy to me, though. If I, if I look at G two in the summer split, mm -hmm. funnel dies, you know, after Rift Rivals, the team downhill. They enter playoffs. They get three zeroed by Misfits, stomped. Like literally stomped. They go into the gauntlet. 
And we all look at them as the weakest team of the Gondola ones based on the quarterfinal, based on the last half of the regular season. But then they actually manage to start playing a lot more around Wonder. They find good picks for Jana, and he steps up big time in the bot lane as well. And they make it to Worlds as a third seed for the first time as G2. You're always first seed. Yeah, they've always been the first seed. Always the big favorite from Europe. Not this time. Third seed, play-ins. And then they actually get out of this group, even with a very, very hard day for them with a lot of very close games. In the end, it is the Heimerdinger, and they do it. Yeah, and, and this is how Perks finally makes it out of group stage at Worlds. This is it. how G2 has their best Worlds performance ever. It, sometimes it does feel like when the expectations change for someone and you get a completely fresh look on something, you can find your way to better results. Because, like, Perks, especially in summer split when they lost in quarterfinals, in the back of his head was probably missing last year's roster. Right? The picture was Sven and Mithy. Yeah, on. Sven and Mithy thinking about even tricks to MVP splits when he was in 2016, playing yep. out of his mind. But this year, right, like I thought Yankos had some insane games, especially on their 2 1 start. So, like a couple days ago, uh, as the jungler that they didn't have last year, right? They didn't have the pocket Heimerdinger pick last year, right? And how clutch did that come in for sure. Yarnan this year? So really cool how they completely changed their identity to get further than they ever have before. And the one advantage it gives you is to not be complacent. It's very easy when, hey, we, we've been the kings of Europe. We keep winning. Yeah. We keep <laughs> winning, right? You know, it's, it makes it hard to kind of look for and identify those areas of improvement. But this time around, they have had to go through all of that adversity to get to where they are, and it's continuing to pay off. Now, the slugfest we witnessed today produced some MVPs. So let's review the master card players of the game. We have Afrika Freaks Tucson, G2 Perks, Flash Wolf Sword Art, Afrika's Spirit, Fong Vu Buffalo's Big Coral, Afrika's Kuro, and joining them is Yarnin <laughs> from the Tiebreaker. Good job not getting tripped up by the like Coral that. Kuro. Yeah, you know, I do all right sometimes <laughs> <laughs> with the prompter reads. Yeah, and the final game, as you mentioned, Yarnin, uh, because of the Heimerdinger, really, there is no way that Flash Wolves didn't think the Mordekaiser Tom Kench would smash that lane. So the fact that once again, he just proved everyone else's Heimerdinger is inferior because yep. they they probably either played it or scrimmed it or theory crafted it and everyone thinks that they can take down G2 with Heimerdinger and nobody can. But it could make sense, you know? Mordekaiser loves to stand in a massive wave where he can just constantly get his shield going, mm -hmm. he can kill them with AoE damage and he can push the lane. Like, in theory, we can see how it could work. We keep saying it though. Do not give this man <laughs> Heimerdinger and it keeps happening. You know, I think you if should. If this happens again in the best of no, fives, man. No, I think man. you should. I think yeah. you should not ban Heimerdinger at all in this best of five. Yeah. <laughs> and then you should play against it That's and it. prove that you can beat it. Period. It's full stop. All right, well, after today's match, as a freak of freaks, earn the number one spot uh, with G2, rather, securing second after their tiebreaker match. With that, though, we say goodbye to the teams that are eliminated in Flash Wolves and Fong Vu Buffalo. Oh my goodness, my heart does break for Flash Wolves as well, not making it out of quarterfinals since 2015. Having it seemingly in the bag, then losing to Fung Vu Buffalo and G2, it was a collapse for this team that mm -hmm. came out so hot to the tournament. They crushed their first two games against uh, Afrika and Fung Vu Buffalo, and you thought, like, they were starting to become in these conversations, like maybe they're just below RNG and, and KT, but right. it turned out to be a mirage. This happens every year. I know. We keep saying this with Flash Wolves. If you say they're terrible coming into a tournament, they, they will do great. Pop off. Yeah. And if you say they're great, they will do poorly. And we just haven't had it happen within the same group stage before. Right. Right? Because we were so reactive. I was neutral on Flash Wolves coming into this tournament. And then I got completely on the hype train. So did I! First two wins. Kind of old, we were all up there. This just morning. to have it fall apart once again. <laughs> group stage at Worlds is crazy, man. But one thing I would like to do now that we have two groups entirely complete and moving on to the quarterfinals is, is kind of compare as best we can maybe the relative strength of the qualifiers to the quarterfinals. You do have the Afrika Freaks right. who struggled on the first couple days with two losses, then stringing four wins together to secure the first seed. G2 sticking to their identity in this tiebreaker and getting it. But out of Group B, you got RNG and Cloud9 who, who, who definitely impressed with much quicker paced games. Yeah, very different styles between two groups, which is very interesting. They kind of all four teams ended up playing somewhat the same mm -hmm. in Group A, and then the same can be said, obviously, for the faster games in Group B, where only Gen.G couldn't do it, and that's why they ended up dropping out. But I think if I look at uh, RNG and C9, because 
the games were faster, because we got to see a little bit more snowball executed, mm -hmm. they looked stronger. I think mean, RNG on paper will look stronger here than Afrika as a first seed for sure. But to me, I think when these teams face each other, I'm not sold on the fact that RNG, oh sorry, that C9 will just like run over a G2 or Afrika. Yeah, I, I'm not sold on that either, but I think the point of the games did look slightly harder yesterday than they did today, and that I think that group is probably a little bit stronger. It was coined the group of death, and then Genji didn't even make it out of that group. Uh, I th basically, what we're saying is a lot of two seeds are looking for that match against Afrika yeah. and hoping they get it. But uh, let me ask you this, and, and maybe this is too in the weeds. Uh, the way that the two groups played out, how do we feel that those come at odds, right? The idea that Afrika today was able to slow the pace of yeah. games down mm -hmm. in order to get some of their victories. Can they do that against Cloud9, or will Cloud9 RNG just steamroll them to, to a finish? I think they can, because to me, the greatest strength of C9 yesterday was not super fast early snowball. It was actually very creative picks that could give them really cool, like almost like wombo combos in teamfights they could use, like a Hecarim mm -hmm. pick that you combine with all the hard engage and you could then like run people over very quickly. Not necessarily from level one, but once you start getting into some of the first skirmishes and big teamfights and also the zillion drafts, they're not meant to be early snowball drafts. And against RNG, the game did go pretty long we got big late game team fights. I think that is what Afrika wants. G2 is the only odd man out who's playing 1-3-1 or wants to play 1-3-1. Yeah. The whole Wild West version of champion select that we've got this year at Worlds is my favorite. The fact yeah. that, again, every team has been willing to pick what they want and not necessarily adhering to any tier list is fabulous. Yeah, I mean, I feel like two split push teams won this group, mm -hmm. whereas RNG and C9, RNG's the hard force team fight, they ended up converting themselves into that early game team. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas C9, I think, showed a little bit of a mix of being a top focused team with just stuff. <laughs> like, <laughs> Sin Zillion, I don't want to just stuff. say like, oh yeah, Sin Zillion, that's a classic 4-1. Right. Everyone weird. knows those two pick, <laughs> picks work fit. together, it's right? Engage and fight. Yeah, that's yeah. what they did well. I love it, I love it. Well, tomorrow, the teams from Group C meet in Busan to compete for their shot at the knockouts. And if we look at the current standings, KT going to the day on top at 3-0. EDG sits at 2-1 with Team Liquid and Mad Team just behind them. Now, those teams will aim to lock a spot in the quarter, starting with our first game tomorrow, where Team Liquid have the tough task of facing ah. KT. Great Holster start. in game one. Then Mad Team and EDG square off in game two. Gentlemen, looking at that schedule, what are your preliminary thoughts? Come on, man. Against KT. We got to start the there, right? That's great for TL. They get a quick win against KT. Yep. Oh, yeah, Big there it confidence is. right there. Momentum yep. going into the next couple of games. Then they lose to Mad Team and still don't get out. <laughs> That's how we can see it go based on that, the two days so far. I mean, you call that the vitality. Yeah, basically. Right? That's point. actually what they did. They it is beat our only team, what they did. And they beat the two seed and then they <laughs> lost to the three. Okay, oh, no. I will make a prediction. I'm so now. worried. KT 6 0. All right. To be fair, I said yeah. the same for RNG. Right. Happen. Right. TL versus EDG. I'm giving to EDG. They get second seed. I think tomorrow will not be as crazy and close as the last two days. I can jump on the 6-0 train with KT. I think mm -hmm. I'm, even though I also said 6-0 for RNG, I'm more confident in a KT 6-0 than yeah. an RNG. I think the day comes down to when TL plays EDG, mm -hmm. right? Obviously, after seeing each team beat each other or lose to each other once, you think you know what's happening, and you're just yeah. expecting <laughs> Mad Team to 06 and KT right. to 6 -0. Any of those things change, and suddenly that TL EDG game is less important? I'm already but nervous. it feels like the most important game of Team Liquid Z. Well, we've had two days and two nail-biting finishes. Hopefully, we get another one tomorrow, but that's going to do it for us here. So now for myself, the casters, the entire live broadcast crew, thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow for more Worlds 2018. Summoner's Rift now for the first game of the day. Afrika Freaks 1 and 2 after the first round rob of the Flash Wolves. 2 and 1. Kramer grabbing the kill onto him as now the Chogat likely going to be killed here next. Maple goes stasis too, but it's already a double kill over the Afrika Freaks AD carry. Ladies and gentlemen, there go the kills we're talking about. Up. Sir, JC's here. No plus no plus I Sometimes it's just about having the best player on the rift. This was Perks just being the best player in this game by far. This is the best Akali performance we've ever seen. Palace the target next. Perks wants to find him. But did got the credit. Steros can't stand any longer, and Perks goes on. Hey, this game was like, stable. Yeah, He's like, we're gonna take that shit. Okay, okay. Tape that shit.
Like tape that shit. Like this or something. It's gonna tape yeah, that shit. Like my cable stable. Take yeah, like that this, shit. Yeah. Like my cable stable. Take that shit. Uh, Let's uh, tape that shit. Let's tape, tape that shit. Goes into the stations to buy some time. They want to. He gets it. Yankos gets the Baron. And G2 moving mop and bucket at the ready. Perk goes into the ultimate, trying to keep himself alive. He's gonna go down to Benny. Flash Wolves are winning the fight. Flash Wolves are wiping G2. Flash Wolves are gonna take this game. Someone, I think he's gonna make it up safely right to now. We get taunted as Kramer takes out Zeros, who dove in valiantly to try and finish off the game. But Big Kuro is dead to Kuro. Kuro's gonna get the next claw. Who's still gonna force another flash as a Freak of Freaks take down yet another Nexus? That moves us up to three and two, still in control of their own destiny, Papa. People are trying to make the play. And so execution number two, up and ready to go. Flash, execute, gets it. Play for the next is exposed to Big Car. He's just gonna rip it to shreds. The upset is there. Him in the beast line. Line. Perks, but Kramer is trying to rip everyone to pieces. Perks, though, he's cutting it out. Perks, he's so low as Kramer. Surfs in at just the right time. Freak of Freaks after starting one and two. Go three and zero. They guarantee themselves first seed. It's going to be the target in the front line. The Tomcat is going to get picked off here. Giannis able to slay the first beast. He pops the stone plate. G2, they're going to get another kill here as the Ergoth cannot defend. And G2 on the precipice of pushing to their first quarterfinals. Bring the cable stable. Take that shit. Uh, let's uh, save that shit. Let's save, save that, that shit. shit.